Ja, wir können ja schon mal beginnen. Äh, mein Name ist Michael Brie. Wir <lacht> laufen uns jetzt ein bisschen warm, bis dann vielleicht noch andere kommen. Ich arbeite für die Rosa-Luxemburg-Stiftung am Institut für Gesellschaftsanalyse. Und ähm, vor zwei Jahren habe ich ähm, Jason Moore eingeladen. Äh, und it took two years, yeah, I already said it once uh, during the day, during the seminar. It took two years to get you to the Rosa Luxemburg Foundation. Um, he will speak then English. Yeah, but ich werde meine Einführung auf Deutsch machen, das klingt auch wahrscheinlich immer noch ein bisschen besser. Das ist insofern eigentlich erstaunlich, weil Jason Moore mit seinem ganzen Ansatz, den er vertritt, also einer, einer ähm, Analyse des Kapitalismus im lebendigen Gewebe des Lebens, Capitalism in the Web of Life, eigentlich sehr stark in der Tradition von Rosa Luxemburg ist. Sein Ansatz einer Akkumulationstheorie, die nicht einfach nur Kapital und Arbeit erfasst, sondern Rosa Luxemburg hat ja als die Erste aufmerksam gemacht, dass es etwas gibt, was außerhalb des kapital lohn ist, nämlich die Welt der, der Kolonien, die sogenannte später dritte Welt, die, Welt, die ungeheure Welt der, der Bauernschaft, die eben mit dem Kapitalismus weiter existiert. Das wurde später aufgegriffen durch Theoretiker der dritten Welt wie Sam Yamin und eine ganze Reihe von anderen, die das äh, weiter ausgeführt haben. Dann wurde es durch den Feminismus aufgegriffen und ausgedehnt auf die Geschlechterbeziehung, auf die Frage der Aneignung unbezahlter Arbeit im Prozess der kapitalistischen Akkumulation. Und in gewisser Hinsicht gibt es jetzt eine Welle, die sehr stark äh, mit dem Namen Jason Moore verbunden ist, die das Ganze vom Natur her durchdekliniert mit der Vorstellung, dass eigentliche Grund, der eigentliche Grundwiderspruch ist der zwischen Kapitalakkumulation und dem ganzen Feld von Gesellschaft, von Mensch in Natur, Kapitalismus in Natur. Kurz zur Vorstellung von Jason Moore, er arbeitet an einer Universität, die zumindest die marxistisch Interessierten hier im Raum äh, kennen, zumindest indirekt ist nämlich verbunden mit dem Namen von Immanuel Wallerstein, der dort 25 Jahre lang gelehrt hat, an, Bingham, an der Binghamton University, einem Ort nördlich von Philadelphia und südlich von New York, also irgendwo genau in der Mitte, dazwischen finden Sie das. Dort hat ähm, Wallerstein auch geleitet das Fernand Brodell Center und äh, Jason Moore ist einer der Mitglieder des Vorstandes dieses Zentrums, steht also in einer Tradition, einer der wichtigsten, schöpferischsten ähm, äh, Analysen des äh, kapitalistischen Weltsystems, was von ihm vor allen Dingen als ökologisches System durchdekliniert wird. Gut, er ist heute Gast. Ähm, der Titel, den wir gewählt haben, Capitalism in the Web of Life oder Kapitalismus im Gewebe oder im lebendigen Zusammenhang des Lebens, ist entnommen ein Buch, das im August dieses Jahres beim Verso Verlag erscheinen wird. Dann kommen andere Bücher, vor allen Dingen ein Buch, was ich allen empfehlen kann. Es steht zumindest als Entwurf, als Dissertation schon jetzt im Netz, zehn Jahre alt mittlerweile, was eine ganz brillante Darstellung der Zyklen, der Umgestaltung des kapitalistischen Naturverhältnisses seit dem 14. und 15. Jahrhundert darstellt, beginnt im ähm, heutigen Erzgebirge mit der Erschließung der Silberbergwerke und geht dann über das ähm, 16., 17., 18. Jahrhundert. Kann ich also jedem nur empfehlen und hoffentlich werden wir das auch bald in Deutsch haben. Also heute Rosa Luxemburg Lecture durch Jason Moore. You have the floor, please. Thank you very much. I will try to get a handle on the voice here. All right, well, let me begin by saying that this is a great honor to be here at the Rosa Luxemburg Foundation and that uh, I hope uh, I can make it uh, worth your time to come out and hear about capitalism in the web of life tonight. So we want to begin with these two terms, uh, and I'll try to explain very briefly what I mean by them before we roll on to a broader survey of how capitalism works in, in nature and the history of capitalism as a world ecology of power and capital in the web of life. 
And so by capitalism, we mean a system of endless accumulation premised on the accumulation of abstract social labor, uh, a rather orthodox uh, uh, view, but one that I think can be creatively applied. The web of life, uh, of course, borrows from the great physicist and theorist Fritjof Capra uh, to point towards a broader holistic view of historical change that includes all life on this planet and the geological and biological processes that are implicated in that. So after four decades of green thought, we have uh, arrived at a very obvious point that nature matters. But it's not at all clear how nature matters in terms of the stories we tell of the modern world, of the limits we face today, and of the way we think through the relation of humans and the rest of nature, that we still have a very strong habit of thinking about human relations with each other with a cap uh, as social, with an uppercase S, that is, society is humans without nature. This is, I wish to suggest, part of the problem, that we need to understand that uh, the relations between humans, so-called social relations, are not prior to the relations of the web of life. In fact, that they are always already both producers and products of that web of life, that humans make environments and that those environments make them, and it makes the organizations that we construct. So there have been two great answers to this question, how does nature matter? And the first is capitalism and nature. The preposition here matters, and, capitalism and nature. And the answer here is that nature matters as a tap and a sink, as a, res as a warehouse of resources, of nature as a waste dump. This gives rise to a particular view of nature and limits, that is, nature as external limit, as natural limit. And this point of view has been largely empirical and largely conceptual. At the same time, this is part of the double yes. Are humans part of nature? Does nature exist as tap and sink? There's a second answer. Yes, that humans are a part of nature. This is the answer of capitalism in nature. And in this view, cap humans are indeed a part of nature. What humans organize and construct is uh, already an ecological process, making war, building empires, all the rest. In this point of view, humanity's natural limits include humans. And so the difficulty is that so far, until the past few years anyway, this point of view has been largely philosophical. Yes, humans are a part of nature. Uh, but the answers are often confused. And they weave two contradictory uh, points of view together. And this has real implications for our politics and, and our sense of history and limits that I think are deeply relevant today. And those I will try to draw more explicitly towards the end of this lecture. We have, of course, the Anthropocene argument, which is a very powerful argument. And here there are two, two elements of this argument. One is that humans are a part of nature. Humans are a geological force. Aha, that sounds pretty good. Uh, and of course, there's a long history to that kind of thinking going back to Vernatsky in the, in the 1920s. Uh, the other is the industrial society, which is prior to the rest of nature, forms independently of the rest of nature, is now overwhelming the separate forces of nature. So we have a dualism from the very beginning, a separation from the very beginning. Of course, it, such separation is purely illusory, that we are not really separate from nature. And I will try to explain why we have come to think in these terms and the kinds of uh, uh, alternatives that are possible to this kind of green arithmetic. Society plus nature, capitalism plus nature equals crisis. So the question, of course, we need to ask, especially here at the Rosa Luxemburg Foundation is, do we want green arithmetic or do we want dialectics? And so yes, dialectics, no question about. So how do, we, how do we reconcile these two points of view? The empirical position of capitalism and nature and capitalism in the web of life? Well, we can't reconcile them within an essentially positivist or dualist framework. 
that says nature is all the stuff over there and somehow this conversation that we are having here is social. Well, in fact, this conversation that we are having here is both a product and a producer perhaps, of definite relations within the web of life and with each other. Many of the things that humans do, of course, are intimately, immediately, um, and deeply connected uh, in a way that transcends the social and biophysical moments, the process of making food and sharing food, of, of making families, raising families, of, of, of building cities, for that matter. It is not always clear uh, in fact, very rarely clear where the so-called social moment ends and the ecological moment begins. They can, however, be synthesized. I think this is one of the core insights that I take out of Marx's own philosophy of internal relations and that in a broad global conversation, scholars in the world ecology perspective have been having over the past few years is how do we see humans configured within the web of life? And... How do we see that as not only a material process, which it surely is, but as a process of knowledge production, of ideas, of culture, that it is symbolic and material, uh, which, by the way, is just as messy and interconnected as humans with the rest of nature. So, of course, not Anthropocene, Capitalocene. Yes? Not Age of Man. The, Manthrop the Manthrocene, that's sometimes called that Manthropocene, sometimes called. Uh, uh, the, uh, uh, there are many, many uh, uh, good uh, candidates, but Age of Capital is as good as any if we want to understand the historical era of the past five centuries as an era of nature, power, and capital. And so in the Capitalocene, I do not mean a period of economic or social history as these terms are normally understood, although what I say, of course, has everything to do with economic and social history, but as an era of environment making under conditions of rapid capital accumulation. In fact, centuries before the steam engine arrives and takes over, let's recall that the steam engine does not, not dominate English industry until after 1830, centuries before that, an era of environmental change ushered in by the new capitalist mode of production and its imperial apparatus, provoked an, a wave of environmental transformations that was faster in speed, wider in scope, and, and bigger in scale than anything known in the history of humankind. No thanks to the steam engine. The steam engine only made it all worse, right? Okay, so we need to move from this focus on a sacred object, the environment. There's nature. Nature's out there, right? Of course, yes. The, the uh, uh, planet revolves around the sun. We have uh, definite biospheric cycles. Yes, yes, yes. And my point in all of this is not to say that that's a construction, but in fact, to say that the separation in our mental frameworks and in our politics of biogeochemical cycles, of the carbon cycle, of uh, uh, long-term shifts in biodiversity on planet Earth, that uh, those, uh, contrib the, the contributions of those processes to human history is in fact obscured by a view that separates human history and so-called natural history. So we move toward, from the environment to environment making, of course, all life makes environments, we know that. But humans can make environments in a powerful and spectacular way. So let's recall our double yes. That is, nature is external to humanity and exists mainly as tap and sink, and that nature is also a web of life that includes humans. Hmm, how do we deal with this? Well, one of the things is that nature, the idea of nature as external to humanity isn't simply a wrong idea. It's a pretty terrible idea. It's a pretty terrible idea because it has been bound up with all the violence of modernity. It is not only a violent abstraction in the sense that nature and society are uh, fetishes that, that abstract very crucial relations from each other. It is also that practically speaking, the boundary setting of who counts as part of nature and who counts as part of humanity 
is one of the fundamental moments of imposing real violence on both humanity and the rest of nature. The great questions of gender and race and, and, not, and class and colonialism in the rise of capitalism turned on the question of who counted as human and who didn't. So as a project, capitalism continually recreates nature as an external object. This has a lot of advantages. Uh, one of the advantages is you can remove obstacles that are in your way, uh, like people who happen to live on the land uh, that you want or the resources you want to get access to. Uh, it has the, uh, the uh, uh, advantage that once you create objects that have the pretense, the illusion of being separate, you can impose all sorts of rationalizations upon them, all sorts of... Uh, all the hallmarks of modern science, which have served to make the planet legible for capital and empire. And I'm not against science. Science is great. And historically, the role of science has been to make the planet uh, uh, legible and understandable for capital accumulation. Uh, but as a, as a process, this idea of nature as external is, of course, completely and always uh, blown up and uh, uh, destabilized because capitalism by its very nature is revolutionary and dynamic and so has to bring in nature of every sort at every point in the production and accumulation of capital and in the production of the conditions uh, necessary for the accumulation of capital. Therefore, uh, let's always remember, and this of course paraphrases Marx here, that accumulation is a process of turning dirt and blood into capital. I don't think that was merely a met metaphorical flourish on Marx's part of turning blood into capital. I think that uh, it meant something deeper than uh, a, a mere, merely a nice turn of phrase. So from the very beginning of capitalism, which I see uh, developing in the 16th, 17th, and 18th centuries, and I'll try to make clear why I think that, uh, one of the, the signal achievements, the decisive achievements of the rise of capitalism was to create this, this uh, uh, object called nature and to separate it off from humanity. This made possible cheap nature. And cheap nature, I mean, in a fairly orthodox Marxist sense in terms of the socially necessary labor time necessary to deliver the cheap labor power, food, energy, and raw materials necessary to make capitalism go. And I'll explain more about the, that as we move on. So in other words, nature wasn't just there. It was actively produced through new combinations of science, territorial power, that is empires, and new, new, uh, new states, and of course, world markets and new systems of credit and all the rest that went into the formation of a modern world market. And at the core of all this, and this is one of many reasons why I am uncomfortable with the idea of characterizing early capitalism as somehow merchant capitalism or pre-industrial capitalism. No, in fact, this was a quite dynamic system in which the production of relative surplus value was pivotal. And it was pivotal in a different way than the era of large-scale industry. It was pivotal because capitalists did not need machinery on the scale of Manchester or later Detroit uh, in order to advance the uh, uh, rate of exploitation. They used the scientific and cartographic and botanical knowledge and, pra and new practices, new forces of mathematization, of rationalization, of surveying to put nature to work in service of labor productivity within commodity production. The consequence for nature in a traditional green account or environmental history account is that much of nature was laid waste on a scale that was, was faster and greater by an order of magnitude, by five to 10 times or greater than what we saw in the medieval era. So, the cis separation, nature and society, it was symbolic and scientific as well, and it was dripping with blood and dirt. So the binary of nature society is the necessary symbolic moment of the era of primitive accumulation and the separation of the direct producers from the means of production. That these did not simply happen at the same time out of happenstance. That these 
were directly related, not functionally related, not reducible to each other, but were involved in a cascading series of historical geographical transformations in this era. So, let us be clear that from the beginning of capitalism, the human nature divide that many of us take, including myself, all too often, uh, many of us take as uh, 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 for granted as obvious society nature. In fact, that is uh, a, uh, a, a deeply constructed and one of the most powerful uh, ways of setting up all the other dualisms that we're familiar with between the West and the rest, man and woman, white and non-white, uh, all of these dualisms that have come under fire in amongst critical intellectuals from the 1970s, but one still stands, that is nature society. And of course, in this period, many people, as I've said, were, uh, many humans were not uh, allowed to be part of society or the new humanity with the uppercase H or S. African slaves, indigenous Americans, virtually all women, these were not part of humanity, these were part of nature. So, we have, uh, when we start to think of an alternative, we have to think of two processes occurring at the same time. That is a shifting boundaries between human and non-human natures, or not quite human, and new material scientific changes in the web of life through new technologies, but also the mounting and accumulating consequences of capitalist development. So the way in world ecology that we are talking about these transformations is to see the accumulation of capital, the pursuit of power, and the co-production of nature as fundamentally constituting each other in and through each other, not as separate boxes that somehow mechanically relate, but as an organic and evolving whole, much as Marx talks about circulation and production and distribution and exchange as an organic whole. So the way that we go about this is to move beyond the idea that we are going to tell the, story, the environmental history of capitalism or the political ecology of imperialism because those ways of telling stories say, I'm going to tell you about the, the environmental consequences of a social process. And we agree the environmental consequences of these processes have been large and terrible and devastating. And we would say that those processes in themselves, imperialism, industrialization, uh, and all the rest, those processes in themselves are bundles of human and extra human nature. They are entwined projects of, of power and production and reproduction. So we begin by talking about something that is a mouthful, I am sorry, even in English it is a mouthful, the double internality. What does this mean? Well, I'll walk us through very simply. Capitalism makes nature, nature makes capitalism. This is asymmetrical, however, and crucially both flow through each other and make and remake each other over historical time. So this means that capitalism does not only act upon nature, but develops through the web of life. And here, this is more than a general principle to apply for all times and places, although perhaps there is some relevance. Uh, but what I am interested in is the relation between historical capitalism and historical nature. That is, every great era of civilizational development, of capitalist development in this case, is both a producer of historical nature and a product of historical nature. That capitalism develops by internalizing the contradictions of the biosphere, of course partly, of course unevenly, and the web of life at the same time internalizes the contradictions of capitalism. Again, unevenly, partially. And there is a historical or secular moment to this in which the transformations of each moment imply a cascading series of changes in the other. However, and it's a big however that we have arrived at today, that the mounting uh, 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 contradictions of capitalism uh, are now uh, creating fundamental and unfortunately irreversible changes in the earth system such that the web of life's internalization of capitalism's ferocious waste generating machine is now 
generating a set of, uh, or, a, or a repertoire of forms of nature that are increasingly hostile to capital accumulation and cannot be fixed in the old ways. Climate change is a spectacular example of this. So are the ongoing uh, contradictions within world industrial agriculture around something called super weeds. You think of Superman, well, super weeds that cannot be uh, dealt with in uh, uh, the old uh, toxic uh, pesticide-centered uh, ways. So this means that nature is not just there. That at a time where no serious analyst of global capitalism would use Marx's concept of production in general to talk about the globalization of production, we still have a tendency amongst left ecologists, amongst the radical green critique, to treat nature in general as a sufficient concept. Now, nature in general is there, but it doesn't explain very much. It describes something, but it doesn't explain very much that what we are looking at are historical natures, that the, the historical nature that obtains at this moment is not the same historical nature that obtained in 1700. And this is so because the web of life itself has transformed. As we know, it is undergoing a series of state shifts, the term that Earth system scientists use. And uh, it is true because capitalism is different. So this tension between the two needs to be brought to the fore. OK. So historical natures are the field upon which uh, capitalism acts and, and the, the field that capitalism in turn transforms. This brings us to one of the fundamental questions of our times. That is the question of value. Now, for Marxists, Marxists have always been very good at one sense of value, the law of value in Marxist sense of the term of, of the primacy of the relations of socially necessary labor time governing reality. They've been less good at the other sense of value, that is value as in what is valuable, value as an ethical and political project. And of course, since the 1970s, Marxists and feminists, amongst many others, have uh, probably been better at this than uh, many Marxists. And today, I think what we are seeing is the emergence of a new set of politics. Here I would draw uh, on my friend Phil McMichael's work on the new ontological politics to uh, emphasize not just movements like food sovereignty, but also the rights of the city, of climate justice movements, of manifold efforts to reclaim commons in both countryside and cities. Uh, uh, many movements that say, um, the old productivist view of nature can no longer be tolerated in the struggle for the emancipation of life. And food sovereignty is an excellent example of this, arguing that the right to food is at once biophysical and cultural and, about, and democratic and about equality and emancipation all at the same time, that those movements cannot be hived off from each other. So when we are dealing with capitalism, we are dealing with a special kind of monster that says, what do we value? What does, what does the rule of capital value? And what it values is, above all, what it can count. And of course, this is the problem, the classic problem of socially necessary labor time. Uh, but it's also an arbitrary and qualitative choice. We're only going to count some things and not others. We're not going to count all the work of humans. We're going to count some of the work of humans. And uh, so we're going to count the work of humans within the commodity system. That's the qualitative dimension. And what this means is that only some, and historically even to this day, a minority of humans work in the commodity system, wage workers, keeping in mind even an expanded uh, conception of wage work that we can debate uh, uh, over uh, in the question and answer period. So, in other words, this is the old uh, feminist critique, which is absolutely central to the politics of the present and to the analysis of capitalism. It is almost entirely lacking in the analysis of the history of capitalism, that some work is valued while most work is not. Aha, that starts to get us somewhere. So this is not merely an oversight. So value under capitalism depends upon social reproduction remaining largely outside the capital nexus. So how do we deal with this problem? Well, I tried to make sense of this question of the work of nature and the unpaid work of humans for a very long time, for about 20 years. I could not figure it out. 
Now, it finally it dawned on me that the decisive connection for capital is <coughs> the relation between that zone of life that occurs within the circuit of capital that is reproduced through the cash nexus and that sphere of life that is uh, uh, that works and works very hard uh, uh, outside that circuit of capital but supports the uh, production of value without that unpaid work outside the circuit of capital. Capital accumulation could not occur. It would simply be too expensive and nobody could make a profit. Uh, so, so instead of a crucial divide between humans and the rest of nature, or between wage workers and, and domestic labor, we need to understand that these processes go on in a fundamentally similar way and from capitalism's desire to turn, uh, uh, to turn some work into value but most work into socially necessary unpaid work. So unpaid outside the work outside the circuit of capital. It does not appear the costs of reproducing unpaid work are defined by the fact that they do not appear on the account books of capital. So the concept that I use here I borrow from George Kafensis, uh, uh, the great colleague of, of uh, Silvia Federici, work energy. And I take this to be the capacity to do physical work. This is a fairly general conception that I will proceed to move into some historically determinate abstractions. And so, of course, some work energy becomes value, but most work energy does not. As we know, capitalism is a monstrously inefficient uh, system when it comes to energy. The critique of industrial agriculture is simply one of dozens of key examples we could give. And that capitalism's valuation of the world depends on the appropriation, not the exploitation, of unpaid work energy. Here, I love Maria Mies' wonderful phrase, the appropriation of the work of women nature, and colonies. So the condition of some work being valued, most work is not. So this, does, this means appropriation we can see as extra economic power to secure the ongoing and regularized appropriation of life activity for free or for very low cost. This is appropriation in service to the exploitation of labor power. Uh, so what this means is it, is it gives us a strategic analytical link, historical link, and I think a clue to politics that, about how to deal with the capital labor relation and how it is necessarily bound to wider conditions of expanded reproduction that have to deal with the problems of uncapitalized nature, including human nature. So I say appropriation. I think that nature is never... Extra human nature is never exploited in the sense that we have come to understand it within the Marxist tradition. That, uh, uh, and I don't see this as letting capitalism off the hook. It is worse. The only thing worse than being exploited is being appropriated. That, uh, and so in this sense, I see the political struggles of the past century in part, and in part is crucial, as turning on transforming uh, the appropriation of unpaid work into something that looks like the exploitation of wage work, hence wages for housework, ecosystem services, which is an otherwise absurd discourse, ecosystem services, but it points to the impossibility of capitalism ever paying its own bills. The secret of capitalism is to not pay its own bills. Yeah. <laughs> Enter cheap nature. Well, why do we need cheap nature? Because we don't want to pay for nature. That won't work. So this means the law of value is a law of cheap nature. And here, this is a classic Luxembourg argument, right? That the reproduction, the expanded reproduction of capital in the circuit of capital depends necessarily on a much larger appropriation of uncapitalized natures, including human natures, outside the circuit of capital and mobilizing them in support of, of exploitation and accumulation inside. Now, something was forgotten in Marxist political economy over the course of the 20th century. 
We all know uh, uh, C over V and constant capital relative to, to variable capital. And everybody said, oh, constant capital. What's constant capital? That's machinery, right? Well, OK, yeah, fixed capital. That's one part of it. But they forgot the other moment that Marx talks about, constant cap or circulating capital. Constant capital has two moments, fixed capital. That is machinery, but circulating capital, the value of the raw materials circulating through the production process. Why is this important today and it wasn't important a century ago? Because there are no front more frontiers to deliver cheap food, cheap energy, and cheap raw materials. And I'll get to uh, why, uh, how that is uh, later in the talk. So uh, at the core of how the history of capitalism has unfolded is what I call the four cheaps. These are the four cheap inputs, labor power, food, energy, and raw materials. Every great era of capitalism begins with some crucial combination of these four cheap inputs. Now, of course, labor power is not only an input, but also a measure of uh, capital itself. So labor power is, as ever, special and distinctive in this process. Oops, that went way faster. There we go. The, the technology has run is revolting upon me. Uh -huh. uh, it's a bourgeois uh, uh, controller. Okay, so uh, the, what the, the primary argument I want to make about value is that in a sense the Marxists have got it right about value and in another sense they got it wrong. The Marxists always said that we have a pivotal economic relation called the value relation that has systemic consequences. I think this is a mistake. I think that value is a systemic relation with a pivotal and central economic moment of capital and labor, but the capital-labor relation itself is too expensive to work for very long without major and disproportionately larger appropriations of cheap nature. And so, uh, a crucial, and what I want to highlight here before moving on, is a fifth cheap, that is cheap money. So today we live in a very unusual and unstable era. I'm sure everyone here knows that. And one of the, the, the ways that we have seen uh, an extension of this absurd financialization is through cheap money. And what does cheap money allow? Very low interest rates. What does that allow? Well, a lot of different things. But one of them is you see in oil the dirtiest, most expensive forms of oil extraction and natural gas extraction that are not particularly profitable are uh, sustained by ongoing uh, cheap credit and cheap money. And we'll try to return that uh, uh, to return to that later. So what I want to give you here is a bit of a cheap, a uh, bit of a, a history of cheap nature and uh, a few ideas that we can experiment with. So let's remember, for one thing, that every new era of capitalism carries with it the new imperialism. It wasn't just the imperialism of the uh, past decade that was new. This is a long history and that we have waves upon waves of, of uh, industrialization, scientific revolutions, and all the rest. And the crucial uh, achievement of all of these revolutions has been to make nature with a capital N cheap, with a capital C. So uh, uh, you, you do this to dramatically reduce the cost of producing commodities, to reduce the reproduction costs of labor power in the heartlands of world proletarianization, to increase labor productivity. Uh, if you look at the labor productivity data of the past 40 years, they were supposed to go up, up, up in the 1970s. They haven't. They've gone down, 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 down. No robot factories. We got the global sweatshop instead. Uh, so these expand the material volume of these four cheaps, labor, food, energy, and raw material, while reducing the price. Not just the relative price, but if you look at the, the history of these crucial inputs over the past two centuries for sure, and probably longer, uh, although the price data is not good uh, for a longer durée, uh, what you see is not just relative but absolute declines for uh, certainly food, energy, and raw materials. Labor power, as ever, is more complicated, and uh, we have uh, only begun to consider 
how labor power is a socio-ecological process on a world scale. So, uh, the great problem of capitalism, of course, is that it, it accumulates too much capital and it can't be reinvested at or above the rate of profit. Okay, this is uh, that's what everyone who reads their first primer on Marx's political economy learns. This is the problem of overaccumulation. Uh, well, the problem, the recurrent problem of overaccumulation, has in fact been resolved periodically by the restoration of these four chiefs. Uh, the class, one of the classic instances of this was uh, w the first Great Depression, the Great Depression of the late 19th century. And that, was, that era, that period of depression was ultimately resolved by the, the massive railroad construction circling the world that allowed for and steamship revolution to make the whole, the whole planet a playground for capital uh, to uh, funnel in cheap labor, that is, dispossessed peasants from Eastern and Southern Europe, from India, from East Asia, from all over the world, to uh, uh, make, open up new, uh, new agricultural bread baskets from Argentina to New Zealand to the American West, to uh, open up new sources of metal extraction from Chile to Canada uh, to Zambia. Uh, uh, all of those dramatically reduced the cost of the basic inputs of production and resolved simultaneously the rate of profit problem and the overaccumulation problem, which makes sense because when the rate of profit goes up, the rate of uh, 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 investment uh, picks up as well, and the accumulation problem is resolved. Now, this points to a crucial uh, issue that we'll touch upon in just a moment, which is Marx's general law of underproduction. It's not just overproduction. That for Marx, capitalism's crisis tendencies the overaccumulation of capital were both questions of under and overproduction. So here I want to give you very quickly, and I, I confess I am going to run through this much too fast. So please be kind to me uh, uh, as I do this. That uh, I'm going to give you three brief models and three brief stories. So the first model is one of putting nature to work. The Green Critique has been excellent at, at outlining what has capitalism done to nature. And there's a whole long list. We could all spend weeks detailing all the terrible things. But in fact, I think the more interesting question is how does, how does capitalism put nature to work? And this involves the question of, of environmental devastation, uh, but is, is so far beyond that. So, uh, what we want to understand is that putting nature to work, which includes human nature, by the way, is a way, is, is the decisive way of advancing labor productivity. Even today, when the price of energy goes up, labor productivity growth collapses. This has been true since the 1970s. So this is a contemporary process, but one that has its origins in the early modern century. Um, and that this is uh, uh, not merely a question of technology, but of what Lewis Mumford, the great urban theorist, called technics. That is, a dynamic whole of ideas and machines and power. And those technics allowed even early capitalism to harness the natures within its grasp to advance labor productivity. Yes, relative surplus value. So this was not simply an era of uh, absolute surplus value, but also of rising labor productivity in one key sector after another. Here's the second model. Everybody's forgotten about this. Uh, this is Marx's general law of underproduction, his phrase, general law. And for Marx, the technological dynamism in production tends to outrun the capacity to deliver cheap, uh, cheap elements of production, that is, circulating capital. Not the circulation of capital, but circulating capital. This tendency of underproduction was, in fact, the key crisis tendency of early capitalism. The fossil fuel revolution shifted that and appeared to make, it, make this issue of underproduction a thing of the past. But as we have seen over the past decade with the commodity boom and then the end of the commodity boom, but not really the collapse of prices, not the return of cheap nature as we had always seen before, 
uh, that it appears to be coming back today. And again, it is not a question of over and under production as separate, but of how they fit together, of how under production and over production fit together. So um, we will get more to this issue of uh, commodity prices and the recent conjuncture in just a few uh, minutes. And the third model is what I've already touched on, that, that in fact, the over-accumulation over of capital and the resolution of the surplus capital problem, and different political economists have different ways of dealing with this, always turns on the restoration of the four chiefs. It's very rarely recognized in these terms. Why is the point important? Well, if you go and read every analysis, at least the, I, every major analysis from the left of the post-2008 crisis, and world economy. I have never seen a single account that understands that nature matters as something more than a context, as more than a set of consequences of, oh yes, we need to deal with nature, but uh, there's maybe scarcity coming, but. Um, but in, in terms of the fundamental model of accumulation, nature is still outside. David Harvey, John Bellamy Foster, David McNally, all brilliant and wonderful scholars and analysts and nature does not matter to the models of accumulation in play. So I want to, to kick off our three stories here and uh, um, uh, start with the rise of capitalism. And I think the thing that I would say is that the scale, scope, and speed of environmental change increased by an order of magnitude relative to medieval Europe. Yes, we had seen large-scale projects before, the Great Wall, the pyramids, but never with this comparable speed and geographical expansiveness of early capitalism. Here is my favorite stylized fact, that in medieval Picardy, northeastern France, it took two centuries to clear 12,000 hectares of forest in the medieval here. Four centuries later, in northeastern Brazil and Bahia, it took one year to clear 12,000 hectares of forest. No thanks to fossil fuel and the steam engine. This is the power of the capitalist relations of production and of the production of nature, even in this early so-called pre-industrial era. So what this helps us see is how earth moving, that is the transformation, digging up of the earth in various ways, and mechanization, technological dynamism, and symbolic praxis and knowledge production all fit together to form the techniques of modern power to create successive and to create and to reinvent successive periods of historical capitalism and historical nature. And so I would emphasize here because in the global environmental change literature, you see this with the Anthropocene discourse, there is a vulgar materialism at play. And I would say that the revolution in commodity production and exchange is, and we have seen many revolutions over the past five centuries, is closely linked to revolutions in ways of seeing and in an expansive sense, Weber's European rationality of world domination, a phrase I always have uh, uh, been very fond of. And so the nature that was created in this era is the nature that we all live with today. That is, here is a view of nature as external, of space as flat, of time as linear. Here, I would side with Lewis Mumford that the clock, not the steam engine, is the key machine of modernity. And here I'm going to just skip through uh, much of this to uh, uh, give you a kind of impressionistic picture of this early modern revolution in landscape uh, and environment making. And the crucial point that I will make with all of this is the, the, sh the, the rapidity, the, the speed of transformation. You know, David Harvey talks about time-space compression, that the circulation of capital constantly accelerates, and that is part of capitalism's drive to annihilate space by time, in Marx's phrase. This is uh, time-space compression centuries before. That no, at no time in the history of, of uh, humanity had, agriculturally, had agricultural zones centered on commodity production and exchange moved from one region to another in roughly 50 year cycles and moved across global and oceanic space to do so. This is sugar because uh, if uh, there is, uh, uh, there, because there was no more 
important economic sector in early capitalism than the interlinked slavery and sugar nexus, that it was an engine of human devastation and environmental change uh, that was completely unprecedented. But what I want to underscore here is the speed, is the speed of environmental change. And in fact, this story was not limited to sugar, and it was not limited to the early modern era. We could tell the story for silver and copper mining both inside and outside Europe. We could tell the story for coal and oil fields uh, over the past two centuries. And the other crucial point that I would make of all of this is that, uh, uh, that this was not merely a question of Europe going out, or Europeans, or some Europeans going out into the world and doing terrible things. This was not merely a, a matter of colonialism being bad for nature, although it was. Uh, but it was a question of capitalist development that occurred inside and outside Europe simultaneously. The crucial frontier was not the frontier of empire, but the commodity frontier. And the commodity frontier was, ex was explosive because a small amount of capital could return a large amount of nature's work. It didn't matter if it were the, 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 the herring and cod fleets of uh, northwestern Europe or the timber products and forest uh, frontiers of the Baltic. Everywhere, everywhere, everywhere this is going on. And oh yeah, if we want to talk about coal and fossil capitalism, start the clock in 1530, not in 1800. Because that's when England's coal revolution takes off. In fact, uh, uh, that is where uh, we get uh, the origins of the steam engine, which is developed, of course, at the uh, pit head, at the very opening of, of mine, coal mines, to extract water. It had to be there because it was so inefficient. So the steam engine only makes sense with prodigious amounts of cheap nature at, uh, at uh, the command of capital. All right, so here is the Industrial Revolution. Of course, this is the lodestar of modern social theory. This is the big bang of capitalism for even for most Marxists, uh, the, even, even despite uh, now nearly uh, uh, four decades of serious and sustained work that shows that, look, it didn't all begin in England, I'm sorry. Uh, if you want to make an or argument for the origins of industrial capitalism, go to the Erzgeberg, right? Uh, and the Fuggers, we know about the Fuggers. The Fuggers were uh, bankrupted in the middle of the 16th century, but they were financially weak already. Why? Because they were industrial capitalists. And why were they facing problems as industrial capitalists? Well, because in the copper zones of, uh, of Slovakia and uh, Bohemia, they had uh, 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 chopped down all the forests. That was one big problem that they faced. And the workers started to organize. Aha. Uh -huh. So the question of work and nature is there from the very center, uh, from the very origins of capitalism. So this was not the first industrialization in the 18th and 19th centuries, but the second. And there were mounting problems, not only in England or Britain by that time, uh, but across uh, the European world economy. Rising food prices relative to industrial prices, this was a gigantic problem. Rising social unrest, the age of democratic revolutions, of course, but also peasant revolts uh, from Pugachev in Russia to Tupac Amaru in Peru, and uh, 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 the Haitian Revolution, the American Revolution, all of that. This was a period of profound uh, trouble for the order of capital. And not just for social reasons, for very profoundly socio-ecological reasons. And in this era, we see, again, a reinvention of capitalism. Yes, cheap coal, cheap energy was pivotal indeed. But let's remember, coal doesn't take over in, in English and in, in British industry until after 1830. Coal uh, uh, and charcoal remains the main source of industrial uh, energy in the United States until 1870. So it's not all about coal. In fact, most ocean shipping did not give uh, way to, to, to steam engines until after 1860, 1870, somewhere in there. So you see all these new revolutions that set the stage for the long American century of industrial dynamism, of uh, cheap energy, not just coal, but also the opening of, of uh, timber and forest uh, product frontiers in Russia and Sweden, uh, new agricultural revolutions that fed the English um, after they had uh, uh, taken all the food out of Ireland, of course. It's always uh, 
a question of imperialism, get the, get the closest neighbors first. Um, new resources uh, uh, and, of course, an ongoing process. African slavery, yes, uh, African slavery is dealt a blow at the end of the 18th century, but it is then rapidly reinvented and redeployed in what Dale Tomich famously calls the second slavery in America, Cuba, and Brazil around cotton, uh, sugar, and coffee. Of course, the ongoing dispossession of, of peasantries and uh, uh, their redeployment to uh, the Americas. All right, now we're going to enter into our closing uh, discussion here so that we can bring some of the insights of this argument to bear on the era of neoliberalism. By neoliberalism, I mean the era of capitalist history since the 1970s, and I would abstract for the moment the whole discussion of neoliberalization, uh, policies aimed at privatization, deregulation of capital, and those uh, kinds of issues. Those are important. But right now, I want to uh, deal with the period of development since then. Okay, so let's recall our four chiefs, labor power, food, energy, raw materials. That is what neoliberalism had to deal with. The crucial issue was that of oil in some ways, that oil had to be stabilized even though the price of energy, uh, the real price was twice or more per barrel of that of the post-war era. This was decisively conditioned by the contraction of the cheap oil frontier. Oil is becoming more and more expensive to get out of the ground. Uh, but also, of course, labor costs were dramatically checked and rolled back um, by the uh, uh, Thatcher-Reagan program, the shock doctrines of Pinochet and the generals uh, in Argentina and uh, elsewhere. And that what I would close on here is that the question of cheap labor and the question of class struggle has to be linked to a broader uh, uh, set of relations with the relations of human reproduction, but also the relations of the reproduction of nature as a whole that includes humans, that includes human reproduction, that includes the class struggles at, at, the, at the points of production. And of course, as we know today, it is becoming increasingly difficult to see where production ends and reproduction uh, takes up, that we have uh, in advanced capitalism uh, blurred <coughs> those lines and uh, sought to create new divisions of labor that uh, uh, both uh, pull global working classes closer together and push them apart. Uh, that, uh, we see five key dimensions of this neoliberal project to restore cheap labor, wage repression in the North, very strong, uh, uh, the falling rate of profit in the US, but uh, also more generalized, led to the shift towards a global factory. This uh, um, underwrites uh, the uh, ongoing problem of greenhouse gas emissions today as the global south became, on a per capita basis, more industrialized than the global north as early as 1980. This is based on uh, the work of my late colleague Giovanni Arrighi uh, uh, and Ben Brewer and Beverly Silver. Uh, the uh, global factory, of course, was not merely industrial and urban centered, but depended on a radical global transformation of countrysides. Uh, that was uh, uh, really unknown in its scale. Uh, 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 unlike anything we'd seen before, the most spectacular instance, of course, is China. 200 to 300 million peasants moved off the land and pushed into the cities, uh, most commonly as rightless uh, uh, proletarians, no rights, no access to services. And uh, this was part of what Richard Freeman the Harvard economist calls the great doubling. This was the creation of a uh, world proletariat that dwarfed anything that came before. But there was also a gender surplus to this process. That is, this was a great doubling of the world proletariat, but surely a tripling or larger of the female proletariat, adding paid work on top of unpaid work on an unprecedented scale. So we want to understand how neoliberalism was working. Uh, this is a crucial part of the story, and this cannot be hived off as a question of labor separate from the question of labor, uh, a question uh, uh, separate from the question of nature. These were uh, fundamentally linked. And I would say, too, that we have the, the, the issue of capitalism and forced underconsumption, a beautiful phrase from my friend Farshad Aragi, who emphasizes that the neoliberal era was not based on a generalized 
uh, uh, over consumptionism, but in fact on the combined and unequal uh, distribution of rights to consumption, such that today we have about three billion people, billion people with micronutrient deficiencies, that is either with not enough to eat or not enough of the right uh, foods to eat. So, since 2003, all of our four chiefs have become expensive. The key question is, can, they not, can, can their expensiveness not only be stopped and halted, but reversed? Can we see a restoration of the four chiefs uh, sufficient to launch a new golden age of capital accumulation, such as we saw uh, after uh, 19, uh, 1947, such as we saw after... Um, the 1840s. So that part is not clear. Um, what about oil? Oil's cheaper today, right? Gas is a little bit cheaper today. Well, one of the things that we're seeing that tells us this is likely to be very short-lived is that the, this is a technical term, but the capital expenditure productivity, that is the, new cap, the, the, the capacity of new capital investment in the world oil sector to deliver a barrel of oil, has declined by 90%, by 90% over the past decade. That means that if I, plunk, if I put down a dollar of investment to go look for oil in the 1980s and 90s, I get a, a barrel of oil back. If I do it today, I get one-tenth of a barrel of oil back, okay? Uh, the, uh, uh, for 80% of the independent oil companies in the world, the cash flow neutral uh, point is $100 a barrel or bigger. This is not from a bunch of radicals, but you know, from those rascals at Goldman Sachs. Of course, they can't be trusted, but they do know where the money lies. We learned that. So, um, what about labor? Uh, people say all the time, well, Jason, there's plenty of labor in the world, right? It's very cheap. There's a surplus humanity. There are billions of people just starving. Well. One of the lessons of, of the globalization studies of the 1980s and 90s was that capital can't go just anywhere. It has to go to particular places. Where did it go above all? Well, to China. Uh, real wages have been increasing very, very fast. Uh, so fast that even the unit, U.S. Department of Commerce is urging domestic capitalists to stay, saying, look, we have cheaper labor here in the U.S. Now, of course, the U.S. Department of Commerce is not necessarily to be trusted on that, but it is true that unit labor costs, along with real wages, have been going up very, very fast. Can that be reversed? Probably not. The, the history of, of uh, wage repression is just that, of stopping wages from rising. But even in the global north where, uh, and in places like the U.S. where wages have stopped rising, the overall reproduction cost for labor power because of health care, child care, elder care, and all the rest have continued to rise. So that's part of the problem of uh, capital today. Um, metals, the same story for oil can be, the story for oil can be told for the story of metals uh, and that it is becoming increasingly difficult and more toxic to get the metals out of the ground. Cheap food, cheap food is never coming back. Cheap food is the foundation of modernity. We've all read Robert Brenner or the, story, the Marxist story of agricultural revolutions. I buy into that. I accept that. Modernity is based on a labor productivity model of agriculture that delivers cheap food and cheapening food to a growing proletariat. That era is done. It is done, 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 done. Why? Well, partly we've lived in the midst of, a, of uh, the biotech revolution that turned out to be no revolution at all. Agricultural productivity growth has continued to slow. Climate change is already active in suppressing the yields of the main four cereal crops, maize, wheat, soy, and rice. And we have the rise over the past 20 years of food justice and food sovereignty movements. I don't wish to romanticize these, but they are asserting something fundamental in the culture of both global north and global south, that the right to food is about more than the right to food. It is about a right to democracy, a right to sustainability, a right to a future that is safe and nourishing and emancipatory. So, how do we, what notes do we conclude on? Well, first of all, I think that limits are always historical. I think that we need to be suspicious 
of the invocation of limits as natural limits as if we ourselves are not natural beings. We are, and so any account of limits needs to look at how humans forge relations of power, production, and reproduction within the web of life. I would say that that means that, his, that nature is always historically specific. And I think most, most Earth system scientists would entirely agree with that proposition. Uh, and so that points to a problem of conceptual language. Our language is very much uh, an early modern language of society and nature. And that became hardened over the course of the 19th century and especially the, the 20th century, first with the invention of the term the economy, which, as Mitchell makes clear, is uh, uh, an invention of imperialism and the colonial project, and then the concept of the environment, which was an invention, uh, as Mitchell also points out in, in his wonderful Carbon Democracy, is, all, is an invention essentially of the oil companies in the early 1970s. So we need to start with a historical abstraction and not a violent abstraction. And that capitalism's political economy works on both a kind of Marx pure capital model and on a Luxembourg expanded reproduction relation with the rest of nature, including human nature model. I shorthand this by talking about capitalization and appropriation. And I think right now we're seeing the exhaustion of a strategy, the cheap nature strategy. It has been dynamic uh, for five centuries. It is now coming to an end. And uh, we need to consider the implications of this. Uh, I don't pretend to say anything particularly groundbreaking here about uh, movement strategy because I think many of the social movements are far ahead of the scholars on this question. I think that the flashpoints of the global class struggle are around questions of reproduction and the way that reproduction is linked with production. I think these are environmental struggles. I think these are struggles over care work and health care and education and a, a whole set of issues in which the relations between production and reproduction are much more intimately connected than we realized in earlier eras. And I think that the insights of movements like food sovereignty and climate justice point to the essential relation between dealing with climate or food and the problems of power and production and reproduction. So I think the strategic lesson is to encourage discussions that unify the most disparate domains, the domains of how do we link climate change and employment, financialization, energy systems. I am aware, of course, that there are calls for either a Green New Deal or a green capitalism. Uh, which in some ways point in the, in the right direction, in other ways I think are very backward looking, and we can talk about those in the question and answer. Thank you very much. <laughs>